Hi, my name is Leah Ross and I hope you enjoy. 1848 was a turning point in European history as rebellion swept across the continent. Most were quashed and France was among the few countries to experience a regime change. Louis Napoleon, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, ascended to power, first as the president of the Second Republic and then as Emperor Napoleon III of the Second Empire. Always a reflection of society, fine art throughout Europe experienced a shift towards realism throughout the mid-19th century. This, coupled with Louis Napoleon's increasing authoritarian behavior, generates questions on how French visual culture reacted and adapted to the changing political climate. In France, the locus of the arts community was in Paris. As such, my research centers on how Parisian art under Louis Napoleon was treated, and the experiences of different disseminators of art with free expression compared to strict censorship. The ultimate conclusion is that Napoleon III extended his totalitarian policies to aid art publishers and exhibitors that he could co exert control over while impeding the means of expression for more volatile visual culture. This conclusion was achieved through a case study of three keystones of the Paris art community. First, the Salon, which received support as it largely promoted Napoleon III's opinions on art. Second, the Louvre, whose renovation was spearheaded by government officials and thus subscribed to his ideologies. And third, satirical comic magazines, which were subjected to intense censorship because they could, and often did, portray Napoleon III in a less than positive light. Starting first with the Salon, even before 1848, this institution was known to be quite conservative and more than willing to bend to the whims of the government. There was a brief attempt at reform in 48 and the subsequent Salon of 49, but it was not very successful. Rather, the jury of the Second Empire Salon was picked in part by the emperor himself. As such, it had traditional tastes and supported the state-sponsored school of realism. Rosa Bonheur is included among these artists. Her horse fair depicts each of the animals with anatomical precision and received great acclaim. For art outside of the jury's taste, especially works that towed the line of avant-gardism, official recognition was harder to attain. Some argue that for painters like Courbet or Manet, this exclusion from the salon was beneficial. It helped them and their movements gain more popularity and forced them to find alternative means to exhibit their works. That being said, there were some government concessions in an attempt to placate the mass of artists that were rejected. This manifested in the Salon des Refusés of 1863, which featured works that had been denied from the Salon by its jury. Pieces like Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe appeared, although all of them, and it in particular, was subjected to ridicule by critics. In 1884, the Société des Artistes Indépendants was formed, holding exhibitions without juries that were open to any artist who wished to display their works. Georges Seurat presented his Une baignade à Anière, which had been refused from the jury that year. The Salon's control over its content exemplifies both it and the government's authoritarian and unyielding nature, especially in the wake of nonconformist presentations. What's more, the discriminatory behavior had consequences throughout Europe as the Salon was the trendsetter for European art, so overall it hindered the evolution of fine arts in the continent. Moving on, the Louvre Museum's renovation was a similar display of totalitarian force. The overall plan was to finally link Les Tuileries to the Louvre, a project initially started by Henry IV. The sculptors hired to decorate the museum's facade had to adhere to allegories of modernity, uh, visions of nature scattered throughout, as well as a glorification of the Second Empire. What's more, Louvre and the Tru Tuileries were used often for elaborate and extravagant government social events featuring foreign dignitaries, as Van Elven's Fête de Nuit aux Tuileries uh, le 10 juin shows. 
The last of these three case studies is on comic art in French satire magazines. While primarily focusing on the infamous Le Charivari, other publications' works are also included. This art form endured strict censorship and boundaries on importation of foreign materials. This is largely because comic art frequently caricaturized the emperor and rarely portrayed him positively. One example of this is Dumier's Paquebot Napoléonien, which features Napoleon III in a tricorn hat of his uh, uncle Napoleon I being pulled along by a disheveled imperial eagle. Although there were some state attempts to regulate Rayan works, implying that radicals of visual culture were not unique in experiencing some form of censorship, those publishing comic art were subjected to considerably steeper and more strongly upheld political and fiscal ramifications compared to written publishers. In conclusion, it's clear that only work favorably reflecting on the emperor or his ideologies received support, while those that didn't were harshly rebuked. This is overall symptomatic of a greater problem of French freedom of expression in the Second Empire. There was literal tolerance if a creator's opinions were incongruous with the establishments. Ultimately, Napoleon III's authoritarianism did pervade deeply into the field of art throughout his rule. This research is, without, is not without its limitations or opportunities for further research. As I chiefly focused on art institutions and publications in Paris, the extent of expression in other areas could be different. The capital could have simply received intense treatment. Thus, further research could explore art throughout the country to determine just how far-reaching Napoleon's mid-century coup d'etat was on his country's artistic expression. Thank you.